up, good agents? Welcome back. And this time we've got a special guest with us. Her name is Jackie Kravitz from hey. Miami. What's up, Jackie? I'm doing great. So excited about this. Been looking forward to it. So thank you for having me. So, dude, I I'm super happy. And if I call you dude, don't worry about it. I'm from Malibu. I'll take I'm it. Malibu, My so, sister calls you know, me dude all the I time. Call so I everybody dude. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Even the clients, I call them dude sometimes, and it's like, you know, they know. Absolutely. It sounds very friendly and approachable. I like it. So I'm good with Thanks, that. Thanks, Jackie. And, and for those of you who don't know a little bit about Jackie, she's a master at for sale by owners. And this is why we have her here. Although she does both for sale by owners and expireds. Yes. Today we're going to be talking about FISBO mastery and really that the mind of the FISBO. And You've sold hundreds of homes to for for sale by owners. Um, can you tell me a little bit of background on you so I don't mess it up, Jackie? Ah, right, cool. I got into real estate in 1996, so 24 years ago in South Florida. I, I live in Miami now, selling real estate in Fort Lauderdale. Interestingly enough, since this is going to be about the mind of a FISBO, I ended up getting a real estate license, Tristan, because I... I was selling my home as a FISBO back oh, wow. in 1996 because I wanted to save the commission. And uh, obviously got a ton of calls from all the real estate agents in the area. About a month and a half, two months into this FISBO thing, I realized eh, this is not going to work. So I'm going to have to hire a real estate agent. And then money was very tight at the time. And I thought, hmm. I have a good idea. Instead of listing with an agent, why don't I just go get a real estate license? That way I could at least save the listing and I could put the house, you know, list it myself. And I did. I actually went to real real estate school because in 96 there was no online. So I attended real estate, real estate school at night because I had two little kids. And no. I got a real estate license just to sell my house and ended up uh, making it into a career. It wasn't my intention. It worked out great. So <laughs> then uh, my first, second year in real estate, I sold 25 homes. There were a few wow. physicals in there. I don't know the exact numbers. Probably I was doing a ton of calls. Just I was making phone calls because I didn't want to work with buyers. I had heard it takes a lot of time. And I had the kids, you know, I'm a stay-at-home mom, cooking, cleaning, whatever. So yeah. nights and weekends, I just pick up the phone and I start calling neighborhood, the neighborhood where I lived, calling Facebooks, calling expireds. And that first year, I sold 25 homes. It really is not a lot, considering I was working part-time, I was pretty happy. Mm -hmm. And then um, starting my second year, I started getting a little bit better in my conversations with Facebooks because I had no sales experience. So I had literally no clue what I was doing. Okay. I was just talking to a lot of people. Well, my I have a question about, about that, Jackie, kind of in yeah. the background, just so that uh, people that are, that are just starting off or have no idea where to start in regards to FISBOs, let's talk about that yeah. a little bit because as you started in this, where, where did you get the scripts from? Like, did you just pick up the phone and say, like, hey, Jackie, your home's for sale uh, by owner? Uh, you want to okay. sell? So I actually, my... After I got the real estate license listed my house and sold it, I, I had my license hung at a Century 21 office. And one day I walked into the office, my daughter was like six months old, my son was eight. So I have my daughter on my hip, you know, I'm walking around, I don't know what I'm doing there. <laughs> and the, the manager broker came up to me and he says, oh, there's a real estate class and it's really great and it's going to be amazing for your business. I said, well, uh, you don't understand that I, I'm not looking to make this into a business and I have the two little kids. I don't have money and I was literally broke. Okay. And so he, I can't, you know, I don't have anybody to leave my daughter with. And then he kept calling me like every other day asking, you know, you really should do it, like insisting that I did it. So I signed up for this real estate training class or whatever. I got somebody to watch my daughter and I did it because he was so persistent. And that's where I got my scripts. I could tell you what class it was if you want to know. Yeah, I want to know. It was Floyd Wickman's Sweat Hogs. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So 
I, you know, they gave us a bunch of scripts and the whole thing, this is 24, going into 25 years ago, to be honest, I don't remember much of anything from that class. I do remember though, the, uh, the instructor saying, there's someone in your market place that wants to buy or sell a house today. If you talk to enough people, you'll find one. I mean, okay, that sounds reasonable. I, yeah. and, and so I didn't really question because I, I don't analyze things. I kind of make quick decisions. That's just my personality. And start thinking, how many people is enough people? Is it 20? I'm like, okay, well, I'll talk to enough people. Okay, let's go. So had the scripts there and I started, I remember back then buying, um, you know, right now, Agents have so many things that can help them get phone numbers like espresso agent and auto dialers. Back then it was like dialing one number at a time on a real yes. phone. And uh, I remember buying some discs. It was called crisscross reference to get phone numbers for, for, for people. I mean, Fizzbos, huh. I drove around, got signs and there was I like the neighborhood where I live, Circle Prospecting. I remember having these discs and it had phone numbers for areas. So I'd search and just, you know, using the scripts I got from Sweat Hogs. And that's, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Then my fourth year, actually my third year, I started working full time. And then fourth year, I closed 100 transactions. And now they were all physicals and expireds. And then I, wow. I stayed at around 125, 130 for several years. And then I started coaching 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago. So that's the story. Nice. All right. So you've got one person here says, uh, Jenny says, sweat hogs. I did that a decade ago. So really? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was 24, 25 years ago. So, I love it. And then a couple of people say uh, you were you were their bold coach too, or bold teacher. So yeah, um, yes, cool. I was a bold coach. Was a bold coach for five and a half years. So yeah, nice. until until first quarter of this year. I love that. All right, so let's get right into it. If uh, I want, I want to touch on both the newer agents that are looking to to do for sale by owners. And also for those agents that are already reaching out to for sale by owners, some things for them as well. But let's start, let's start with the newer ones. The challenge right now, and it's, it's no different than, than last year, the year before. It's still a challenge mm -hmm. regardless of, you'll pick up the phone and what are you going to say? Your yeah. approach when it comes to understanding the mindset of a for sale by owner, uh, what is it that differentiates them from everybody else so that we can better approach them? What, what is that about them? So what is it that differentiates them? So I, I will give you the positive stuff and then the mm -hmm. negative stuff in regards to how, you, how we look at it and how they think, right? What's different about FISBOs, and this is one of the reasons why I, I literally fell in love with FISBOs. I ended up becoming good at expireds a little bit later on, but in the beginning, that first year when I started calling expireds, after a couple of months, I took a break because they terrified me. I mean, a, a new expired, I mean, now I know how to handle it. Back then, 24 years ago, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm Miss Jackie on the phone. Hi, and they're like, why are you calling me? And I'm like, Oh, what have I feel like? What's going on? Because new expires are like that. Fizzbos? Yeah. No. Fizzbos are easy to talk to. They're not easy to necessarily get them to give you an appointment to list that, like a listing appointment, but yeah. they'll talk to me. You know, they, they didn't scream at me, hang up like expires. They would, they would say, oh, do you have a buyer? Sometimes they would say, I'll be willing to pay a commission, or if you want to see the house, come to my open house. They talk, so they're easier to approach. And initially, that's why, like that first and second year, even though I was calling expired, I wasn't really getting, you know, as good results as with FISBOs, because as a new agent, I would say, call, talk to them. They will talk to you. That first year, I would, because I, again, didn't know what I was doing. So I would say, hey, you know, I could come by, look at the house. I could prepare a market analysis. 
now they could actually find value of homes online. Back then, no, back then a market analysis was some, it was something special. Even now, if I, if I were calling a FISBO today and I have no experience, I would make the call and just ask, you know, I'd love to come by and take a look at the property. I could prepare a detailed market analysis for you. I wasn't going in to really make a listing presentation. I was going in to just meet them, preview the property, bring the market analysis, some things that might help them and just kind of, you know, get to know them, feel a little comfortable. And then what I started doing is I would follow up with them about twice a week. So, and those follow-ups now, for the more experienced agents, Tristan, I have a different approach, okay? So okay. this is just to kind of get yourself feeling more comfortable with, with, with talking to Fizbos and going out there. So then I would follow up with them every twice a week. You know, they would do open houses and I would just call and say, hey, Tristan, Jackie, you know, we met a few days ago. How's it going? What's new with the sale of the property? Are you getting activity? Hey, and I would give him a little, do you know the house down the street sold or it went pending? I give him a little bit of market information because I was focusing mostly in the neighborhood where I lived. So I kind of knew the area. That's how I started getting more comfortable with the process, right? Got it. And I would call him on Mondays. I knew they were doing an open house to say, hey, so did the open house go? How many people did you get? It was just like a building rapport kind of, Yeah. Yeah. And I remember the first FISBO I ever listed. I remember their name, the house, everything. It was about <laughs> three months after I had been there initially and three months of calling every week, every week, every week. And I remember after three months, I didn't even, I wasn't even having a conversation about let's list the house because I didn't know what I was doing, right? So I'm just, Got it. yeah. So I remember I, after three months, how is it going? And they said, you know, like we're kind of tired of this and I think we're ready to, to list with an agent. Can you come out and list our house? I'm like, whoa, blew my mind. Okay, yes, I'm there. And I remember going to take that listing and I didn't really ask them. The, the, the husband said to me, he said, you know why, when we put the house on the market three months ago, we got so many calls from agents. Actually, like that first week, we probably got hundreds of calls. Two weeks into it, eh, maybe 20 were following up. Two months later, three. Three months, you're the, the only one who's calling us still. That's the only reason why we hired you. He was like joking. He's like, you're the only one that was persistent enough to just, yeah? So that was my, that was my first FISBO. And that's what I would recommend for the agents that don't have the experience speaking with them, just to start to feel comfortable with the conversation. I know a lot of agents now are doing Zoom presentations like we right on Zoom. It's no different. So instead of saying, can I come by and meet with you today at four o'clock, you just say, I'd love to set up a time on a video conference just to share a little bit of market information with you. I would still prepare the market analysis and I'd be calling them back and following up and always offer something that might be, that would be useful for them, whether it's some tips to make the home look better or a little bit of market information, anything about real estate so that they don't, you're calling to see how they're doing and how things are going, but you're also bringing some information about real estate. That, that worked for me those first couple of years. Yeah, so that you're bringing a couple of good things, and I just want to reiterate them. Uh, one is that you're giving value, right? You're coming with value. That's, that's easy. Everybody should be doing that, and they know that. Right. So it's just a matter of actually putting that into play and finding what that value looks like. Yes. Right. The other parts are not so easy. And and that's only because we've seen it a lot. And it's just for some reason not easy for people. The mm -hmm. consistency and that applies across everything. Yeah. When we're talking about for sale by owners right here. 
I think the title that we have here is really the mindset of for sale by owners, but I, I would, I would probably even change it to the mindset agents have with for sale by owners because uh, yes. that's honestly the biggest challenge, right? Yeah, for sure. And so in, in regards to consistency, because both a veteran agent like myself and like you, um, it can still be a struggle sometimes with some things. So how do you first stay consistent with the follow-up, however you've structured it? If you're a new agent or if you're an old, uh, not old, but a veteran agent, right? I think the, the biggest thing, Tristan, you say it's not easy. I guess what? It wasn't easy for me either because what I would call the first sale by owner and they would say to me, yeah, no, I'm not going to list right now, maybe in a couple of months. So they wouldn't say, call me in a couple of days. They would say, you know, I'm not interested. And most of the time it was just, I'm not interested, period. Sometimes he would say, you could follow up with me in a month or two. And so I, I, I had a very simple system. I, I don't, I think when I got my real estate license, I bought my first computer. I mean, this going back, like, I don't know, there was no internet, like life was different, or at least I didn't have access to any of that, right? So yeah. I remember for my leads, how I kept track of it, I went to Office Depot, bought out those accordion folders, you know, those brown things that are like an accordion. Yep, yep. And it was one through 31 for every day of the month. And then I had um, five by seven cards, a stack of five by seven cards, you still buy them by the hundreds. Okay. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm talking to a FISBO, they become a lead for me, I pull up a blank lead card, as soon as I hang up on the car, I write down today's date, Tristan, you know, their name, the phone number, address, and a couple of quick notes. And then I take that lead card, I deserve sticky notes, I would take the lead card and put into like, today's what, the 28th. So yeah. if I'm gonna call them back on Monday, and Monday is June 1st, I put that on the first in my folder, my accordion folder, on number one. And then every day I would just pull the ones for that day and call. Now, the challenge was actually, it was a very simple system. You know, I didn't yeah. have it on, I mean, I didn't have cell phone, all the stuff we have today. And I think the simplicity kind of helped me. I had them all in one place. I think that is so important, having all of your leads in one place, because if you have some on your phone, some on your computer, some on some kind of soft, whatever it is you're gonna do, keep it all in one place so you don't lose people, right? Yeah. And a challenge that I had with calling people back was, because I, I used to write down brief notes, right? You don't wanna write an essay, this is like quick, putting notes on the, the lead card. And if they said, um, especially in the beginning, because I believe them, if they say, no, I'm not listing, you know, call me in two months, I would write down, not listing, call two months. And then when I pull the lead card out of my, my thingy there, my accordion, a mm -hmm. few days later, I would read that. And then I start second guessing my, my calling them now. Okay, call into my calling two months. Oh my gosh, it's only been like five days. They're gonna yell at me. They're gonna say, didn't I tell you to call me? Why are you calling me five days later? <laughs> so I, literally I, I would have a conversation with myself and I would talk myself out of calling. It wasn't easy. Cause uh, yeah. And I lost a lot of leads for that reason, for talking myself out of it. And I'll say, oh, okay, well, I'll wait another week. So I put him a, a week later. And I kept in the beginning, I kept postponing because I, I was kind of literally scared of calling them because they would say, you know, tell me, didn't you hear me? And then I started calling some people and three weeks later, they would say, oh, I just listed with an agent. And I'm going, what the heck you told me? You weren't going to list with anybody for two months. Yeah. So I started learning not to allow myself to talk myself out of calling when as often as I needed to, because consistency is, I, I learned the hard way. I lost a lot of leads that I thought were really good for the first couple of years because of not being cons consistently following up. 
All right, that makes a lot of sense. So now if, if we would apply the right systems or processes or, or, or a better system or process to the agents now, what would that look like if you say, okay, you're just starting off, this is what I suggest you do as a follow-up, so you stay consistent, and then you would say more to the veteran agents, okay, veteran agents, this is what I would do since you already know what to say to them, you already know how to engage with them, this is my follow-up for you. What would both look like? So the first question is the follow-up if you're new to the whole FISBO conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. It would be kind of what we were talking about a few minutes ago, Tristan. Just Is it that two, two times a week, right? Yeah, okay. I would say two times a week. You've got to get used to that, always bringing value. And for the most part, just ask how they're doing. And when you talk to every time you speak with them, wherever you're keeping your notes, write down something brief that they said that when you call the next time you could ask about it. So a very easy one is like if they say I'm doing an open house on Sunday. Well, I'm calling them on Monday. I wrote down open house on Sunday. So I'll ask, hey, how, how did the open house go? And now they start talking. Great. Yeah. So and if they say, well, I had a buyer look at it last week. They said they're going to bring me an offer. Okay, waiting for offer. From buyer. So I would ask last time, so hey, did the buyer ever come around? Did you receive the offer? Following up on something that they have going on, an objection, and always on those calls, a little piece of information of value. Don't overthink it, don't overcomplicate it. And the truth is the information of value you could, for an entire week with everyone that you talk to, use the same information. Right? Yeah. You don't need to every every person you talk to come up with something different or every day something new. Just every time you speak with them, just a li even if it's you know interest rates just were just lowered or anything. So it, it makes it easy. Yeah, you know I'm I'm gonna go off a, a little tangent on that just just okay. uh, because I agree with you. All right, and and I think that's right, and I think the challenge the challenge that we face as agents is that let's say I'm talking to you, Jackie, and we're going, I just started the conversation with you and you're like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it on the market. I'm going to test it out to see how this goes. I don't want to use an agent right now. I want to save on commission. That's the number one reason. Yes. And, and then agents, here's where they fail. They go in and they say, well, well, why wouldn't you use an agent? Don't you know that we can save you money? Um, and the challenge is you're tackling the wrong question. And I, I think a lot of the times we try to force and educate the for sale by owner yeah. when we need to be trying to really find their motivation by asking better questions. And so if Jackie is telling me, and this is going to be a value, so I'm going to the value section. That's why I agreed with you. If Jackie is mm -hmm. telling me, well, Tristan, you know what? I just want to, I just want to save money, right? That's why I'm not using an agent. So instead of saying, well, don't you know that you can save money by using an agent here? Let me explain to you how. Uh, the question should be, it's kind of like the Socratic method where you're going and saying, well, what does saving money look like to you? Right now, all of a sudden you're playing the game with them, right? And I think this is where agents fail because we're always trying to push and say, hey, we're awesome because of, check this out, and look what we've got over here, right? So, so that, if I may say, Tristan, yeah. yeah. So for, for the newer agents or newer to FISBOs, this approach of just asking questions, how are things going, offering some value, making some suggestions, that's how I did it my first couple of years. Yes. Now that's how we all did it, by the way. I was, that's how exactly and it worked for me. Forward. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Around my third year, I I started just becoming more knowledgeable and more confident in what I was doing. And then I changed that approach. Yes. And a part of the reason why I changed the approach too, obviously more knowledge and experience, and I was listening. 
I, I had a coach already at the time and I'm listening to a lot of agents that were doing really well and I'm learning from everywhere. I mean, I, I was just bombarding my brain with everything that I could read, learn it from, from people that were doing really well with it. And also what happened around my third, fourth year, the market started changing. In 1996 in Fort Lauderdale and that MLS, I remember when I got into real estate, there were about 20, I remember because I used to look at this stuff. There were about 27,000 homes, residential properties for sale in the Fort Lauderdale MLS. And wow. every month, maybe 1,500 sold. It was a buyer's market, no doubt. Yeah. Wow. And then around 99, 2000, it just completely changed. Then it turned into the hottest seller's market. Even if you weren't, yeah, the agents that weren't in real estate at that time, it was like a revolving door. So the MLS in Fort Lauderdale went from 27,000 available, 1,500 selling per month to 3,000 available and 3,000 selling every month and 3,000 being listed. It was literally a revolving That's door. That's insane. Yeah, 2000, 2001, 2002, three. So my approach of following up and following up, that would not have worked in the early 2000s because Fizbo's were selling. I mean, anything was selling. Anyone, any, you know, things were nuts. Thank goodness, around my third year, I started learning how I could actually bring value, financial value. And so, I changed my approach and I started having different conversations with Fizbo's that I perfected over, over time. And so then if you want, I could kind of tell you a little bit about that approach, which yes. could be a good one for yeah, the more tell experienced. Us, tell us the value because that, that's where I was heading into with that. I'm like, look, there's a lot of value you can offer. But it starts with questions, because if you just bombard people with value, how do you know that that value is for them? Right. Well, and you know, when you say starts with questions, the person asking the questions controls the conversation. And I think that's a huge mistake that agents make. They, they start talking. And so you got to remember when you start talking, they're not even listening. So you're oh. just... Bleh. So you're in the middle of saying something and they're like, well, no, I'm not listening right now. I'm busy right now. Call me and cl click. Cause you're, it's, so yeah, that, that's the, the biggest challenge, right? And again, you're not controlling the conversation. So I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll talk about the value Tristan in just a moment. And first, you know, the mind of a FISBO, right? What, what's going on in their mind? I remember when I first got into real estate hearing like, you know, you better watch out. This real estate career is not going to be easy. You know, real estate just have a really bad reputation with the public. It's just like, you know, the public sees real estate agents as car salespeople. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is yeah, it's not going to be fun. And interestingly enough, a couple of months ago, I was going through my, uh, a, a little book I'm studying for my continuing education for my real estate license. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a page where they were saying they did a study or survey or whatever, where they asked adults, American adults, do you trust real estate agents? And 68% said no. Oh, wow. No. I know, right? I, I mean, I, I heard that when I first got into real estate. I actually, I didn't know that it was a real thing. Like there's a number and they studied this stuff. And so when, when we call a for sale by owner, we got to remember most people out there, most homeowners, the public don't trust real estate agents. True. I'm calling someone they don't know me. They have no idea. Jackie, who? Like, they have no idea who I am. They're getting a lot of calls from real estate agents. And most agents are doing what you said, which is wrong, which is talk at them. And, well, don't you know? And this and that. And, I could, and they don't want to hear that. So they already have a bad kind of feeling about, you know, these real estate agents. They, so... Most people don't trust agents. I assume a, a, a FISBO doesn't trust me. They don't know me, so why should they trust me? Even if 
you know, they knew slightly something about me. Most people don't trust real estate agents. They're selling on their own because they think they can sell it for the same price that I could sell it for and save money. So they don't think they need me. They don't trust me. They don't know me. They don't think they need me. They don't want to list with an agent because if they wanted an agent, they would have hired one already. So this is their mindset, right? Yeah. And that's what I am caught. Like when they answered, hello, I gotta, I gotta know what's going on in their head. If I may, so I, I love what you said earlier, because if I call them and I start saying, well, you know, don't you know that you're not, you know, you're not going to be able to get the same price or what you're doing is not going to work, which by the way, I know is what most agents do. They, at some point in the conversation, it, they take the approach of making the FISBO feel like what they're doing is not going to work and it's wrong. And you know what? I don't know anybody. I mean, you tell me if you know somebody that just loves talking to people that whatever they say, I say you're wrong. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Right? No. So true. my approach is totally different. If they say, you know, I don't need an agent. I can sell it myself. I'd say, Tristan, absolutely. I have no doubt that you can sell it yourself. I mean, you sound like a very smart person. There's no reason why you wouldn't be able to sell it yourself. When I say, when I talk like that, to, they don't know what to do with me. They're like, what? I, I've heard an agent talk like that. So, and, and the fact that I'm making that, and there's a question following me saying, you know, I have no doubt that you can. I mean, you're, and saying, you know, this is a great script when you say, not just for physicals, when you say, you sound like a very smart person, boy, they love that. Yeah. And, you know, I have no doubt that you can sell it yourself. Let me ask you. Now comes a question that's going to put me back in control of the conversation. Because when they give us an objection, they're in control. The objection is usually, I know I don't want you. It could even be a question, how much do you charge or you know, whatever. When they give, you, give us an objection, they're in control. So I completely diffuse this objection by repeating what they said and agreeing with them. So now... It, the, the, the beauty of this agree, approve, repeating and approving, right, that we call it, yeah. the beauty of that, too, is not only they don't know what to do with me because, you know, okay, so how could I argue with her? She's saying she agrees and I'm smart and I could do it. Also, it won't keep that objection coming back. Because when they don't feel like we heard them and we got what they're saying, mm -hmm. I could start talking, which is the mistake most agents do. Well, you know, I could do, do this for you and I could do that or blah, 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 whatever it is they say. I don't know. And then the same objection, they're going to come back and say the same thing. Yeah, no, but I don't want to list with an agent. No, I can sell. They're going to keep repeating because they don't feel like I heard them. Yeah. So... And then at some point they just get tired or frustrated or whatever. And they're like, you know, I'm, bit, I'm not, I'm not listening right now. Click. And it's over. So That's it. repeating what they said. And then the question, right? The question that follows the, I have no doubt you, you can sell it yourself. And Tristan, let me just ask you if there, if there was a way where, I can work with you in the sale of your property. And you would actually be able to net more money by working with me than if you sold it yourself. Is that something you might be interested in looking at? Yeah, and I, and I love that. So I'm gonna pause you right there, Jackie, because sometimes it takes a while to get to that question. And agents just go right into it and they lose you, right? So. Notice everyone how he, she said first, look, you're capable of doing this. I have no doubt that you can sell it on your own, right? And then she probably goes in between and says, but why is that important to you? Tell me, explain that to me. I need to understand that, right? So she asked it in a way where it's, 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 it doesn't, it's not condescending in any way, right? It's all right. in reality. And so then they'll tell her and then they'll be like, well, look, it's important to us mainly because 
we're really tight on money and we're going to use this to buy our next home and we really need to net the most. And that's when Jackie then just set them up, right? Right. Now, when you, the, what you just said, when they say, well, we want the most money possible because we're going to buy a house or we're doing this, we're doing that. I'm going to repeat and approve that again. I never go into a question without saying, Tristan, I hear you. <laughs> Obviously, you're looking at this and, and, and you're thinking, wait a minute, if I can sell my house and I can sell it for the same price that a real estate agent can sell for, why not? To be honest, if I was in your situation, I'd be thinking the same way. Again, they don't know what to do with that. Yeah. And that's when I come out and say, and, and when you look at it, Tristan, and I know I may even say this, I, I would say, and let me ask you, and I know initially when I ask you this question, you're going to say, ah, I don't know how you could possibly do that. And it's a hypothetical question. If, I, if there was a financial benefit for you to work with me instead of selling it yourself, wouldn't you at least want to know about how that could be possible? Yeah, I love that. The other, the key to this too is, you use the word condescending. If I say anything that makes them feel like I'm talking down at them or I'm it's making over. them wrong or I'm done, 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 it's over. So it's that I got to sound interested, concerned. Yeah. And then when I say, is that something you'd be interested in looking at? Would you consider it? It's very non-threatening. And it, it's because of the way it's worded, if there was a financial benefit, they're like, it's a hypothetical question. How am I going to say that? I'm not saying, if it makes sense, would you list with me? No, because of course they're not going to say yes. They don't know me. That's right. So it's a very approachable way that they would say, they may say, well, you know, how, how, I, I don't see how you could do that. Sometimes yeah, that, they say that's that. A, that's a common, that's a common one. Yep. Yeah. So if they said that, I would say, Tristan, I hear you. You're, you're, you're doing the math in your head and you're saying, wait a minute. I mean, how do I pay your commission? Obviously, I know it's not making sense to you right now. And that's exactly why I'd like to meet with you for just 20 to 30 minutes. And I'll show you exactly how I could be of benefit to you in the sale of your home. And then at the end of our meeting, you can decide what's best for yourself. So would three o'clock work for you today? Would four be better? That sounds so much better than then. So if all of this sounds great to you, are you ready to list with me when I show up? Yeah, and you know, I, <laughs> that's a pretty qualifying question. Yeah. You don't ask it like that of a for sale by owner. You'll scare the heck out of them. Okay. It's yeah. a prequel question. You would never ask. And here's another mistake. It's some agents that more experienced agents will make. They start asking pre-qualifying questions before they set an appointment. I thought we were, I thought we were supposed to pre-qualify appointments, not somebody that you don't have an appointment with. So yeah, exactly, that's the I, yeah. So yeah, no, and and once if they say yes, let's say you would say yes, I'm still gonna pre-qualify as an experienced agent. Like for the newer agents, just go, just go, just go meet them, go see the house, go build rapport. Don't worry about it, right? That's what I did. Yeah. The more experienced agents you want to pre-qualify. So let's say I say, would three o'clock work with four be better? You say, okay, four o'clock. Great. Now, Tristan, so I can better prepare for our meeting today. Just a couple of quick questions I'd like to ask you. So when we sell your home, where will you be moving to? Motivation. I don't even care about their motivation until after they said yes. Because here's, going back, if I may, back to the mindset of the FISBO, right? The only, you and I, well, we don't want to use absolutes. So I'm not going to say only. Right. The main reason why 99.9% .9 of agents are selling, of, of uh, homeowners are selling on their own is to save a com the commission. That's why they're trying to sell FISBO. 
right? Yep. And so, and they're trying to sell on their own, as you said. What, why is that important to you? Because you want to save the commission. I actually, my, one of the first questions I ask them after I build a little bit of rapport is, it just that I'm just curious, is saving the commission the main reason why you decided to sell it yourself That's instead it. of using an agent? They're going to say yes. And that is what leads me to the benefits, right? And so remembering that 99% of them are selling on their own to save the commission. The money is the only conversation that they really care about. They don't think, remember, they don't know me. They don't trust me. They don't need me. They don't want me. They don't want to need all that. So if I call this complete stranger and I start asking, so where are you moving to? How soon do you want to be there? They're like, none of your business. What do you, what, what, who are you? What, why should I be telling you what I'm doing with my life? They're like, That's yeah. it. The only thing they care is why they're doing it and, and what I say around that. Con I learned this the hard way, you know, yep. calling thousands of Facebooks and years of, doing things in a way that didn't work so if you yeah. if you say yes so now we have an appointment then i go so tristan when we and I, notice how i say when we i'm being assumptive like we're gonna do this together so when we sell this home what are you thinking of moving to it's very subliminal they don't even catch it great and do you have any kind of time frame oh no i'm not in a hurry excellent that's that's great because obviously it sounds to me like it's more important for you to sell it for the most money possible and keep as much money as possible than how fast you sell. Would that, would that be accurate? I'm repeating yeah. and approving and they'll say, yeah. And then at some point, you know, I'm going to ask uh, how much they owe because I want to make sure there's equity there. Um, I'll ask if there's someone else involved in the decision, will they be present? And then at the end I'll say, so Tristan, when we meet this afternoon, if at the end of our meeting, you feel confident that hiring me is the best financial decision you can make, would you consider doing it? Maybe. So that question, will you list with me? See, I, I soften it up. I'm still asking it. I'm just not like expecting a straight yes from somebody who doesn't know me, doesn't know how I work, has no clue, how could they? So the hypothetical, if you felt that it's the best financial decision you can make, would you consider hiring me? And so, well, I guess if I did, it's almost impossible to say no. No, no, yeah, I love it. And so I'm gonna interrupt you there only because you gave me goosebumps, all right? So here's why. Okay. It's a good thing, it's, in a, good, it's, a, it's a good thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, Everybody here listening, we've got 300 people on the webinar and like another 200 people on Facebook. So awesome. um, a, as you guys are listening to what she said, it's not just important what she said, it's how she said it. And a lot of us just go ahead and read what we're learning with no, no genuineness behind it. And that, that tonality really is what gets you through the next step with them because and Jackie's gonna say yes on this one. There are two types of personalities that sell their home for the most part, drivers and analyticals. Drivers, they think, they're like, oh, you know what, this is easy, I can do it. I don't trust anybody else. So those, those damn real estate agents, they're getting overpaid. They're driving this and this and this. Analyticals are like, whoa, whoa, no, I've broken this down. I've interviewed seven agents. I know what they're doing. And so those are the two main types of personalities that you're going up against. And what she did with her tonality gets through to both. You because as, a driver, as okay. a driver, the biggest fear I have is the agent taking advantage of me. That's my biggest fear as a driver, right? So Jackie and I are both drivers uh, probably because, I mean, she's calling it thousands of for sale by owners, right? You either have to be crazy or a driver. And exactly. I'm so both. Then, there you go. We're both both. And on the analytical side, um, the tonality softens it so that they then question, okay, this person is kind enough and she knows what she's talking about. Maybe I'll give her a chance to show me 
exactly how this breaks down, right? So she gets through to both. So I, I love that, Jackie. The tonality was so on it. You know, Tristan, what you just said about this approach works with both personality styles. In 25 years, I never thought of it that way. I know it does because I've done it. And I know it, it, it works for everyone. If I'm speaking with an amiable or, you know, I, I, I may soften a little, a little bit because I'm, I'm mimicking and matching them. So I don't want to freak them out. I never actually thought of the reasons why it works for the different personality styles but you're right it does so yeah well look we both bring good qualities to the table you do things i have never thought of doing and approaching this in awesome ways right and same on my end because i've been calling since not as long as you have you have definitely more years on calling which i love right uh but you know we're both doing this so let's get into value what would be some of the things that you think would be great at giving uh, the for sale by owners kind of like processes so we don't give them all at once right what are some of the cool things that we can offer that you think they need so are you asking about how i the value and how i benefit them financially if they were to hire me or like like for instance you mentioned at the beginning all right so i've yes. got this cma and i've broken it down i'm assuming you also say like if you've got one a local lender here's one that i have something yeah. along those lines absolutely or if there's maybe some help with paperwork you know are you are you familiar with x disclosure that is needed in our area especially now right with covid uh -huh. absolutely yes, yes. They're always like a ton of dis different disclosures, lead-based paint, this disclosure. So just one of them. Another time you could mention the seller's disclosure. You know, are you familiar with that and how important that is? Because now you're educating them. And at the same time, it causes them to question if they really know what they're doing. And even if they say, well, I'll have an attorney handle the contract or handle the paperwork yeah that's fine absolutely it's just so that you could be familiar with some of the paperwork required um, ideas on how to stage the property how to prepare it for sale how to make it look the best that it can for a great first impression um, recommending maybe like you said lenders or three different home inspectors if they find a buyer and the buyer, you know they could yeah, there's just so many things that we you know i i think that we as real estate agents because we do this every day trust and we take it for granted that this visible has no clue That's like they don't know anything so whatever we the things that we do every day that we take for granted that are so simple and easy for them it's like everything yeah. So, I'm going to pause you because I had a, I got a compliment for you. So okay. uh, Varsha says she is, she is so personable and by far one of my favorite webinars thus far. Thank you. So Aww, that's so nice. Thank well, you. Look, just, just my to, day. to be real, you're one of my favorites too. Oh, <laughs> that's so cool. Thank you, dude. Your tonality is just on it. It's like, why would I not give you the opportunity to, to show me what you can do. That's the power of tonality, right? 100%. So I'm getting a lot of people they, saying that they agree. So ditto, uh, you are the best. Great compliments to you. So Appreciate it. I have a, a couple more questions and then we wrap okay. up. We've got about nine minutes. Here's a really okay. good question. It's by anonymous, but I think it applies to what a lot of people are thinking. How do you handle the ones where uh, an initial conversation was made, but they no longer answer your call. Uh, when do you quit on attempting to call? Wow. Well, I love this question. Good question, right? So, yeah, it is a very good question because, you know, we both, uh, we've all been there, right? In situations yeah. like that. Um, here's my approach with lead follow-up because this is, you have a lead, it's a great lead, and now they don't answer your call anymore. Be obsessive about following up. You got to think about what that looks like. And I say that because 
I earlier said that I lost so many great leads because I talked myself out of calling or I would call and they didn't answer and I wait another week and then I call a week later and they're listed. I lost so much business by under calling or not being able to get a hold of people. I mean, there's always going to be a certain number that no matter what you do are not going to answer the phone. Yes. So when I say obsessive and I, I kind of changed into becoming like that around my fourth year, cause I'm like, you know what, this is really makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to continue to lose leads. So obsessive would be Tristan, you become my lead. I'm following up with you three or four days later. I call you in the morning after I do my calls for the day. You don't answer the phone. I leave you a message the first time. If you don't call me back, so let's say I leave you a message around 11.30 noon. If you haven't called me back by 3 p.m., I'm calling you again. I will not leave a message at 3 p.m. And I only let the phone ring four times because if somebody doesn't answer the phone by the fourth ring, they're busy, they're in the middle of something. And if they pick up the phone, they drop what they're doing. Now nah, got a, not a good situation. So at three o'clock, I call again. Four rings, you don't answer, I hang up. I would call you again around 6.37 p.m. Four rings, don't answer, hang up. Next morning, I'm calling you again. Mm -hmm. I may or may not leave a message. I'd be calling three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. Maybe every six, seven calls, I would leave you a message. Hey, Tristan, it's Jackie, just calling to see how things are going, how you're doing with the sale of your property. Give me a quick call when you can. My number is blah, blah, blah. Thanks. Click. Okay. And then what if they pick up, uh, Jackie, if they pick up and you've talked to them maybe two weeks ago and they said, Hey, we're not ready right now, which everybody says, uh, oh, or saying, Hey, you know what? Thank you for calling me again, but we're still going to list it ourselves. Love the question. Because one of the things, again, I started doing this years later is if I keep following up or even after the first, on the first call, at the end of the first call, if I'm not able to set an appointment, I would offer help. And that script sounds like this. Tristan, I completely understand, not a problem. And, and here's what I like to do, if it's okay, Tristan, I'd like to leave you my, my, my cell phone number. Do you have a pen and paper handy? Oh, sure, yeah. My number is, or I could email it to you, or, but I would like him to actually write it down. I used to have a pen and paper handy because I keep my number, Tristan, because if at any point, you have any questions or you need any help, even if you find your, uh, your own buyer. You may get somebody looking at the property and saying they're interested in making an offer and you have some questions, call me at any time. I'd be happy to help you in any way that I can. And, you know, again, anything at all that I can do, feel free to call me and uh, we'll stay in touch. Take care. Bye. Do you send them a postcard at that point? Do you send them anything in the mail? Again, my first couple of years, I didn't like my third, fourth year. What I started doing is I, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you remember those little magnets that have a calendar every month is a little piece of paper. You yeah, put it in I, <laughs> I used those before. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. So this is going back like, you know, 20 some years ago. Yeah. I used to get those by the hundreds. And then you peel and you put your stick your business card. Yeah. So what I would do after, at the end of my first conversation, I would say, and, and so Tristan, hey, keep my number. So if you if you need anything, have any questions, feel free to call me at any time. And also, I'm gonna go ahead and put my business card in the mail to you. I would just say business card. It will go out in the mail today. So look for it in the next couple of days. So you you know keep it handy and let me know if I can help you in any way. Thanks. Again, it's coming from, you know, offering and uh, it, it works wonders. <laughs> and that ma mailing out that little, I mean, I don't know that I will do the colander again today because I don't know, that seems so old fashioned. It worked for me. I used to go into appointments now and I see my calendar in their fridge. I'm like, yeah, 
They kept it. <laughs> so, That's so good. That all that would the sending out the calendar with the card also gave me an excuse for the next call. So I would make sure that I would put my card, that card in the mail the same day that I spoke with them. So if it's local mail, it would, they would get it two days later, next day. So then three days later, hey, Tristan, it's Jackie, the real estate agent is saying, how you doing? Great. Had anything exciting happen with the sale of your home? Oh, same, same thing. Hey, did you receive that business card, the little calendar I sent you? Yeah, yeah, I got it in the mail. You're, I'm just kind of, you're getting to know me. You, you talked to me once, you got my card, I'm calling you again. I'm kind of, you know, becoming someone that you're like, yeah, you know, she's cool, she's helpful. She's offering to answer questions. It's, yeah, it's fun. Just talking about it this way with you makes me feel like, yeah, Fizzbos are so fun. They really are. That. If I can, Tristan, because I know we're running out of time. Yeah. One of the reasons why I originally like fell in love with Fizbo's is, yeah, I remember that Sweat Hogs instructor. There's someone, in, someone, somebody in your marketplace that wants to buy or sell today. If you talk to enough people, you'll find one. And calling around my neighborhood, I had to talk to hundreds to find one. And guess what? Fizbo, it's one to one. I'm calling someone and they want to sell. And they don't have an age. I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. It's pretty easy, right, at that point. I know. It's just a matter of consistency, like you said, having a plan and making sure that you're talking to them, not at them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah and there was a question here that I want to get here. So, uh, oh, there was a question one that I skipped at the beginning here. Linda Session says, so... Would the listing get the full commission? Uh, here's her question. So would it be accurate to say as a seller, you pay closing costs, so you'll be paying a buyer's agent where they have the benefit of an expert or you may be letting yourself exposed by not having an expert represent you? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm, I think it says, so would the listing get the full commission? Um, hmm. I think anything that has to do with, oh, listing agent, with the listing agent get full commission. If you do both sides, well, at this point, Linda, you're just going, you're trying to get the listing yourself, right? To be able to represent them as, as the agent selling the property. And then there would be a buyer involved uh, and a buyer's okay. agent as well. So there's two different commissions unless you double end it. So I guess I answered that one. Um, yep. What question for you, Jackie, there's a whole bunch of questions for you. So I know we're not going to get through all of them. Let's just ask you one that was asked about 10 times. Okay. Are you still teaching? Are you coaching? What are you doing? Because people have questions about that. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, What's the best way to get a hold of you? Is there an email that I should put here? Or you can. It's uh, my 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 email address is just easy. Jackie Kravitz at yahoo.com. And you would be able to find me on Facebook too. Send me a friend request. All right, Jackie Kravitz. I want to make sure I spell it Kravitz right. Kravitz like Lenny. K R A V I T Z. Perfect. Lenny Kravitz. I got that one. Lenny Kravitz. Now Jackie Kravitz at yahoo.com. I love it. All right, put it in the chat box. So everybody that's asking, this is being recorded and we're going to put it up to our Lab Code Agents YouTube channel by tomorrow. So I'm putting the link there right underneath her email address. So do me a favor, subscribe and then click the little bell because when you click the bell, when we upload the video, it notifies you by email. So uh, Jackie, I want to have you back again. Ah, uh, that would be fun. I'm down. All right. I think uh, maybe we go, we just do like, like the follow-up process for sure. like intense follow-up process. What do you think? Just go over I that. I love that. And that's, that's going to be required. Even when you're experienced, you're not going to be able to convert all of them on the first call. So that's like a critical piece. Yeah. I love that. All right. I'm going to email you too. Okay. So that's good. Can't wait. Thank <laughs> you. So much. Thank you Thanks so everybody. much. I really appreciate it. It was a Thanks lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.